It was in the sixth century, in kind of the eastern Alpine regions of uh, Swiss or Switzerland and Austria, Germany, that a new character began to emerge in folklore, in mythology. This character uh, was an anthropomorphic figure, a very kind of goat-like creature, goat hooves, kind of goat face, horns coming out, had a long tongue that was split, had fangs. The name given to this creature was Krampus. Maybe you're familiar with Krampus, maybe you're not. But it happened over there, and so their kind of tradition mythology would be that on December the 5th, what would happen is Krampus, along with his good buddy St. Nicholas, would actually show up to kids' homes. And so Krampus is almost like the, the, the counterweight, the counterbalance, the good cop, bad cop of St. Nicholas. And there in that kind of region of the earth, uh, it was said, it was thought to be kind of pretended in, in mythology that they would show up. And what St. Nicholas would do is St. Nicholas would reward the good kids with presents. But then you had Krampus, this kind of devilish looking figure. Oftentimes Krampus was represented with chains, kind of like, uh, you know, God has bound Satan. So you hear these chains rumbling. Oftentimes Krampus, if you see a, a picture, a drawing of him, he would have a sack or a bag. It was to kind of take the little children and take them to hell. But he always carried with him switches, birch switches, because Krampus was there to beat the naughty little children, okay? And so this is kind of what's going on. I just got confirmation in between services. A guy who grew up in Germany was like, I got switches in my shoe every year. And so Krampus, just so you know, has kind of, kind of come arise and kind of taken on some popularity, has gained some momentum, not just in the Eastern Alpine region, but now even in the States, in 2015, there was a movie uh, produced about Krampus. We now have kind of Krampus walks and Krampus festivals even here in the States. And so you go, what in the world is happening, right? How is Krampus, this devilish figure who kind of takes switches and beats naughty children, why is this taking off? Why are people celebrating this and dressing up like this and engaging in this sort of behavior? Well, the Washington Post actually picked up on this and they wrote an article about it. Inside the article, here's what it says. The interest has grown in Krampus as people celebrating Christmas look for a counterweight to all the holly jolly. In an era of climate doom, political nihilism, high definition war, beam to our phone, there's something about Krampus that can feel more authentic. And I think that's the case. That for the past month, you have been inundated with perfect presence and perfect families in a perfect setting, having a perfect meal. There's all kinds of uplifting, holly jolly reindeers and cookies and snowflakes. But yet reality says it may not be like that. There's actually more of a griminess and a grit and a darkness that hangs over most of our lives than just what's personified in holly jolly Christmas. And so people kind of can resonate a little bit more, even with this satanic figure of just saying, you know what? My life's not perfect. I see the evil in the world. I see the darkness. Things aren't always great. There's some naughty people out there. And maybe I do want to lash out and see them punished. And so there's even this kind of gravitational pull away from just this perfect Christmas into something that, that reads, although kind of a little darker, it reads and feels a little bit more authentic. As we're going through 1 Corinthians 13, this Christmas, instead of just taking the wise men and Herod and doing that whole thing again, to take one of the candles, one of the aspects of Advent, love, and going into 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and just wringing it out and looking kind of verse by verse, what does the first Advent mean about love? And walking through that, maybe when we start reading the definition of this agape love of God, you kind of approach it like Krampus. And you go, I, I don't know that that's real. I, I don't know that that's what I feel. I'm not sure I resonate with this perfect love. Reminder, here's what Paul says about the agape love of God. He says, it is patient and it is kind. 
It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It never rejoices at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. This agape love of God, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things and endures all things. And maybe we've been preaching about that and talking about that and you're like, sure, that sounds all warm, fuzzy unicorns and rainbows, but it just doesn't feel like reality. Maybe there's a little bit of skepticism, maybe some rightful cynicism that creeps up inside of you to go like, is this love legit? Is this love real, authentic? Is it really available for me? And we've just seen again some of the darkness of the world has kind of crept in that not everything's like this. We see it in our pop culture. I mean, I remember the shows I grew up watching. Main character was Steve Urkel. I love me some Steve Urkel. Steve Urkel, that's not flying today. There's a griminess and a grit now to the shows we watch, to the movies we see, to the songs that are sung. I remember in middle school just bebopping to a group named Hanson saying, mmm, bop, right? That's a world that's different than our world today. And so maybe even as we approach this biblical text that is true, there's something that comes up inside of you. It says, really? Is this love legit? And will this love last? Now, why do we ask that question? Maybe in the deep recesses of our mind? Because you've never known or experienced a love like this. Every love you have ever known has failed you at some point. Every love you have ever known will at one point pass away in this earth. Go back to one of those early Christmases. The toys you received that broke within 24 hours. Maybe when you were growing up, you had a best friend at school who you loved who moved away. Maybe for you, it was your parents who said they loved you, but parents make mistakes. And sometimes they're huge. And maybe your parent who said they love you even walked out on you. For some of you, maybe it's a, a job you had that you loved this job, thought it was amazing, but then the co company got bought, something downsized, you got laid off, a new boss came in, a coworker, and destroyed that whole thing that you thought you loved. For some of you, maybe it's a spouse that you stood on a stage like this and said, I'll love you forever. And then they fell in love with someone else and walked away. For some of us, maybe the people in our life have really exemplified agape love of Christ, but they have since passed away. Last Saturday, spending time with my family outside, just enjoying the weather. And over the course of that day, I received three different texts of people who experience loss. A grandmother, a father, and a young child who all passed away. And so, yes, we come to this text and we go, sounds great, sounds nice, sounds wonderful, but how can I be sure that the love of God for me will truly last? Because every other love has failed me. It's fallen away. It has passed away at some point. Now, the apostle Paul, maybe anticipating a little bit of cynicism, skepticism in us. The Apostle Paul, who is inspired by, moved by, guided by, and superintended by the Holy Spirit, now writes these words to us. He says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. For knowledge, it passes away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall be known fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul is wrapping up this excursus on love, saying love never ends. The word he used there is meant to provoke a mental image in the audience. It's a word that means to slip, to fall, to falter. 
Scholars and historians would believe that there's a road from Athens to Corinth that Paul would have traveled on. Very steep and treacherous road. If you've ever been hiking or something in a national park on the side of mountains, right? There's some really narrow passageways with loose rock and you can slip, you can fall, you can falter. And he's saying here, the love of God, the agape love of God will never once slip. It won't glitch. It won't wane. It won't falter. It won't be destroyed. It won't die. It won't decompose. It won't be downtrodden. It will never cease to exist. It will always remain. He's adamant. He's passionate about it. But maybe the skeptical and cynicism wells up inside of you again and be like, yeah, but I've heard that before. Somebody else, something else has told me it'll never end, and it did. So how can I be sure about this love, that this love will never end? And here's what Paul does in this moment. He says, the best I can do for you to try to answer that question is to point you to the eternal state, is to point you to second advent. I know we've been doing Christmas and first advent, but he says, man, let me tell you about when the perfect comes. And that's the best way that Paul thinks he can show you that yes, the agape love of God is different. This love will never falter, will never slip, will never end. Every time we celebrate Christmas, we think about the first advent, it should not be without also contemplating, thinking about, looking forward to, yearning for the second advent, the arrival of Christ for the second time. We see this so beautifully in the songs we sing, but also here in Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared. First advent, Christmas, babe in a manger. And that brings salvation for all people. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion, to live self-controlled, upright lives in the present age. And we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second advent. He said the first comes to bring salvation, and then the second we sit here and we wait and we hope and we long for it to come. There are two that should never be separated. We have to celebrate the first and long for and think about the second. So Paul is doing that. He says, when the perfect comes, that's where he's trying to point your mind to, to understand and say, yes, you can know the love of God never ends. Now, when the perfect comes, there's debate among scholars about what this actually means. I'll give you kind of the three primary ways of interpretation and tell you which one I think it is. So many people say uh, the, 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 when the perfect comes is actually the close of canon. I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's in view. I don't think Paul knows what the canon is. I don't think he's going like, oh yeah, I'm going to write this and it's going to be one of the 66 to make it into the rod, the measure, the standard. And when that's closed, then the gifts will pass away. I don't think Paul has that in view. And secondly, people go, well, when the perfect comes actually means it's the maturity of the church. Like, the gifts are given to the church in its infancy state to kind of boost it, to help it get going. But then, as it matures up, it won't need those gifts anymore, right? But again, that's so subjective of when that happens. And also, I don't think that's, that's anywhere in view in the text. If you're asking me, and the scholars I'm reading, what I hold to, and when he says when the perfect comes, he means the second coming, the advent, the second advent, when we kind of enter into this perfected, eternal state, that's what I think. Because look, I mean, look at the text. He says, number one, it's perfect. Would anybody describe what we're experiencing right now as perfect? No. And that's why we have the rise in people doing Krampus walks and festivals. It says you will fully know. Anybody here? Want to go on there and say, I fully know everything. And it says in the text, you'll see God face to face. That's not happening. So just in the text itself, I don't think it's a close of canon. I don't think it's a maturation of the church. If you're holding to that, I think you're bringing a biased opinion to it and doing some hermeneutical gymnastics to support a position you have. I think a straight reading of it is just like, he's saying when the perfect comes, the second advent of Christ. Now the agape love of Christ, he's saying it never ends. When it comes, this never ending love of Christ is perfected. I want to belabor the point for you, hopefully to make the point for you. 
But I found an author who put this in such a beautiful way that really stirred my emotions and affections for the Lord in thinking about what the second advent, when the perfect comes, will be like. They write, in that day when the perfect comes, there will be nothing that is abrasive, nothing irritating or agitating or hurtful, nothing harmful or hateful, upsetting or unkind, nothing sad or bad or mad, nothing harsh or impatient or ungrateful or unworthy, nothing weak or sick, nothing broken, nothing foolish, nothing deformed or degenerate or depraved or disgusting, nothing polluted or pathetic or poor or putrid, nothing dark, nothing dismal. Nothing dismaying or degrading or blameworthy or blemished or blasphemous. Nothing faulty or faithless or frail or fading. There will be nothing grotesque or grievous or hideous or insidious. Nothing illicit or illegal or lustful. Nothing marred or mutilated, misaligned or misinformed. Nothing naughty or nasty or offensive or odious or rancid or rude or soiled or spoiled. There will be nothing tainted, nothing tasteless, nothing tempting. Nothing vile, vicious, wasteful or wanton. When the perfect comes, this is what we experience as believers in Christ. And some would say, come on, Paul, come on, Destin. Like, you've heard that term, like, don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. I think Paul is saying, on the contrary, until you have a healthy obsession of when the perfect comes, what's next? You'll never be good in this life. See, when I know when the perfect comes, the second coming of Christ, now that frees me to not have to pursue excessive accumulation here in this world. And now allows me to respond appropriately to injustices in this life. Having my mind, a healthy obsession of when the perfect comes, allows me to endure present sufferings today. I think it's a good healthy thing to be thinking about when the perfect comes, the second advent, and what it means for us. So what Paul does here is he gives three different comparisons, three different illustrations of a child, of a mirror, and of knowing partially, all in which to kind of prove, yes, the love of Christ will remain. It is never ending. It never slips, falters, or fails So the first illustration he uses is that of a child growing into a man. We'll reread the text. Paul says, love never ends. Prophecies, they'll pass. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, it will pass. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, some, I think, will use this text and actually misuse it to say that, oh, the spiritual gifts, they're childlike, they're childish, they're immature. That's not at all what Paul has in view here. It's not what he's doing. What he's trying to show is the difference between the now and the then, the present and what is to come in the future. And he's saying that, yes, hey, as children, we we grow up. Actually, when it comes to the spiritual gifts, he says, there is a built-in obsolescence. Kind of like us and baby food, right? There was a time in our life where baby food was good, was healthy, was, was necessary, but none of you guys are leaving here going like, mm, what restaurant has the best baby food, right? Now, maybe you could do Smoothie King and that kind of like green thing kind of reminds you of, you know, whatever. But there's diapers and pacifiers. There's, there's built-in obsolescence. And so the gifts are never meant to be permanent. That's what he's trying to show here. They, they don't survive the transition from the now to when the perfect comes. They're provisions for the imperfect world, for building up. Again, there's nothing bad, nothing wrong. They are absolute necessary and good. But my friends, when the sun comes up, you don't need a flashlight anymore. And that's the point he's trying to make here. Spiritual gifts are for this life only and will at some point in the future terminate. But love is permanent. It's eternal and it never ends. This is why love is superior to the gifts and why gifts exercised without love are worthless. Now, why is he belaboring this point? Why is he making this? 
Because here's what is happening in Corinth. People are putting their value, their worth, and their identity in the gifts they possess. They're saying, man, this, this, I've got this gift, and I'm going to make this the ultimate. And he's trying to lift their gaze and lift their view and goes, hey, you're defining yourself by something that's temporal, not eternal. You're building your life around something that is partial and not permanent. Something that will eventually fade away. And so he's calling them, no, no, no. Focus on when the perfect comes. Focus on, invest in, build your life around something that will last forever, which is the agape love of God. That's what he's trying to call the Corinthians, what he's trying to call you and I to. So the question we ask ourselves is, what am I investing in? With my time, my talents, my treasure, Am I pouring into, finding my worth and my value, building my identity around something that is temporal or eternal? Is Jesus and the love of Christ first priority and preeminent in all areas of my life? When it comes to my family, when it comes to my relationships, when it comes to my finances, when it comes to my career, is Jesus first? The love of God. That's what he's trying to get them to do. Not focus and hone in on the partial and the incomplete that will pass away, but and what is eternal? What will last? And invest, invest, and focus on that. Second thing he does is he uses the illustration of a mirror. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. So Paul, we, we know from the book of Acts, he spent 18 months in Corinth. So very familiar with their culture, very familiar with what they do as a society, things of that nature. Now in Corinth, they were amazing metal workers and some of the finest um, bronze mirrors of antiquity were found in Corinth. And so that's what they were using, bronze mirrors, and they polish them up, and, and that would kind of be the mirror in the first century, all right? And so he says, hey, we see in a mirror dimly. That's probably what Paul has in mind, these bronze mirrors made in Corinth. He says, but, but when the perfect comes, we'll, we'll see face to face. Now, here's what he does not mean. He does not mean now the way we understand Jesus and the agape love of God is distorted. Like that mirror is warped, it's broken, it's twisted, it's perverted. We can't truly know. That's not what's in view here. Probably there's a primary and a secondary. The secondary is this. There may be, when it comes to understanding God and the agape love he has for us, there may be a fuzziness. There may be a cloudiness. It may not be distorted. Like we are actually seeing the real thing, but there's a, a mystery to it. The word here that's used for like in a mirror dimly we translate it to the English word enigma. And so is there today a mystery to Christ and his love for us? Is there sometimes a cloudiness? Absolutely there is. But probably the primary thrust, thrust of this passage and what Paul is meaning in this is indirectly versus directly. When you see someone in a mirror, it's indirectly. I mean, if I were to turn around and hold the mirror up and I'm looking at you guys, that's indirect seeing and indirect viewing. And he's saying that's what's happening now after the first advent, but the second advent when the perfect comes, it's not indirect anymore. It is directly seeing God face to face. If he were writing it today, I, I suppose he would probably say like, it's the difference between seeing a picture of somebody, seeing a video of somebody, and then actually meeting them in person. And so before in this church, we didn't have all these cameras in the room. And since COVID happened, we've got cameras in the room. And so now most of the time when people come to Rock Point Church, they've already kind of like seen Rock Point Church and they'll watch it online for a couple of weeks and they'll eventually like show up. And so it was about three or four months ago, I, I met a woman, a family right here, right down there. And um, they said, we've been watching online, but now we're here in person and you're bigger. And in my mind, I was thinking like, taller and more muscular. And they're like, no, just bigger. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, but there was a difference, right? They had watched me on their TV in their living room. But then when they showed up, I was bigger. And so this is what Paul is talking about. He says, you know, not indirect, but face to face. Face to face. It's, it's actually even referencing to him, Moses would talk to God face to face. Now that wasn't a literal face to face. Like Moses was just melted, right? It, it was a, it was a, there is no intermediary. Moses was able to get direct revelation from God. So there's this, this intimacy together. But now in this moment, this time, 
all we have are reflections of Jesus. But Paul's like, imagine when we get face to face. One author writes this, in the pages of the Bible, we see Jesus reflected. Although we cannot see him directly, we find ourselves beholding the glory of the Lord. We see him with the eyes of faith and we come to know him. But the Bible, God's breathed word, no matter how wonderful it is, no matter how clear of a picture of Jesus it reflects, is not Jesus himself. The Bible was not born for us, nor was it crucified for our sins. The Bible did not rise and ascend into heaven for our justification and glorification. Only Jesus is that. It is absolutely reliable. But the reason we love reading the pages of Scripture is because we see reflected in them the face of our Savior. But oh, how sweet the day when we see him face to face. There is no longer a reflection or an intermediate, but it is direct communication. Lastly, what Paul uses is a comparison between partial and complete. He says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Let me take you back to the upper room where Jesus, just hours before his crucifixion, gathers his disciples for one final time. And there in the room, Jesus seating at the triclinium at the place of honor, steps up, comes and grabs the water basin, takes off his outer robe and begins to wash the disciples' muddy, dirty feet. What he is doing in that moment is he is reenacting the incarnation for them. He said, I was at a place of honor, seated in a place of honor, and I stepped down and stooped down and humbled and humiliated myself to come down here and to wipe up the mess and the sin of your life. But in that moment, Peter, one of the disciples, protested, no, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. And listen to what Jesus says to Peter. What I'm doing, you do not understand now. But afterwards, you will. It's what Paul is picking up on here. That right now, there's a partial knowledge. But when the perfect comes, there will be a full, complete knowledge. That same statement could be said about Abraham. Could have been said to Moses. Could have been said to Joseph. Could have been said to Ruth. Could have been said to you and I. There are things you are going through and experiencing right now, and you're like, I don't understand. And he says, but when the perfect comes afterwards, then you will know fully. Now, I don't believe this know fully is like God's omniscience. Uh, You know, again, I could be wrong on this. You can debate me on this. It's fine. But this is just my thought. I don't think when the perfect comes, when we get to heaven, all of a sudden we're just omniscient like God. I think we're omniscient in the sense of like, we know everything that can be known. And here's what I think would just be a beautiful, beautiful thought. Again, just just Destin's thought. That we get directly to God. We see him, intimate knowledge of. But then for all of eternity, we get to learn and explore and grow in the knowledge of an infinite God. His infinite love. His infinite grace. His infinite character. His infinite goodness. It kind of reminds me of when Jamie and I had the the blessed opportunity to whitewater raft the Grand Canyon. And so to do this, you have to stay at one of the worst hotels in America, a dumpy little hotel. They give you earphones uh, when you check in, and there's a train that just runs by all through the night. But in the morning, you wake up, and you take one of the dirtiest buses and bumpiest roads, but you get down to the Colorado River, and they put you in, and the Grand Canyon walls are all on side of you. you. You are there. There is full, complete, intimate knowledge of it. And then we start rafting the, uh, the, the river and the rapids, and the water was so cold. I got a brain freeze just from the water splashing on my helmet. I mean, it was freezing. After an hour or so of that, we get to a part where there's smooth sailing. And so you put the oars up, they crank a motor, and then for a couple hours, they just guide you down the Colorado River. And I'll never forget that experience. Because around every turn, I would go, oh, wow. And then we take another turn. Ooh, wow. And then we take an, oh, wow. You know, I mean, it's just, like I've seen the Grand Canyon, but just something about every turn, there was something new. There was a nuance. There was more to be explored. 
even though I already had direct intimate knowledge, is that not the same thing we get to do in heaven? That we sit there and we show up to God, to the Grand Canyon, face-to-face intimate knowledge, and for all of eternity, we just get to, wow, oh, I never knew, look at that. Again, maybe to belabor the point, but to make the point, one author writes this, God's love cannot be quantified. It exceeds calculation. His love is deep and wide and high and wealthy. It is plentiful, abounding, infinitely replenishing. Our experience of God will never become stale. It will deepen and develop and intensify and amplify and unfold and increase and broaden and balloon. Our relishing and rejoicing in God will sharpen and spread and extend and progress and mature and flower and blossom and widen and stretch and swell and snowball. It will inflate and lengthen and augment and advance and proliferate and accumulate. It will accelerate and multiply and heighten and reach a crescendo that will even then be only the beginning of eternity, new and fresh insights into the majesty of who God is. His love never ends. Paul's pointing to when the perfect comes, the second coming to remind us and show us of that. And then what he does here, he kind of maybe snaps you back to reality. He says, so now faith, hope, and love abide. They remain. They continue. He said, I've got your mind on the second coming, and that's good about the perfect love of God that never ends, but, but let's snap back to reality. The, the God of God is not just for then. It is for now, along with faith along with hope. There are people who believe that faith and hope will one day cease to exist, and it's only love that remains. That's not what the text says. The text says hope, love, and faith all continue, all remain, all abide. Well, how so? It may be semantics, but faith, if you define that in a sense of belief and reliance on God, is that not something that lasts into eternity? If you define hope as expressing confidence and trust in God, Is that not something that lasts into eternity? And then he wraps up with these words, but the greatest of these is love. And he doesn't tell us why. Well, we're left to speculate, to assume. And so I'd love to just share my three guesses. And there's so many more, maybe infinitely more. Why is love the greatest? Number one, I believe it's the greatest because it is the true, lasting, defining, and genuine mark of believers. Jesus' own words in John 13, he says, By this, all people will know you're my disciples if you have great, amazing, spectacular gifts. No. If you post a lot of Christian things on social media. No. If you do a lot of Bible studies and have really good biblical knowledge, no. By this, people will know you're my disciples if you have agape love for one another. Why is love the greatest? Maybe because love is the defining mark of genuine Christianity and of Christ's followers. Maybe why love is the greatest is because the circumstances of your life can never disprove or negate the love God has for you. I know some of your stories. I know what some of you are walking through. It can be heart-wrenching, incredibly difficult. And we know that the love of God is not negated by or disproven by hard circumstances in this life. The circumstances, no matter how hard they are, never negate or disprove God's love for you. God's love for you was shown in the creation of all things. In the first advent that we're celebrating, in his crucifixion on the cross, in his second advent when he comes to make everything perfect, that's how God's love was displayed to you. And no matter what you're walking through, no matter how difficult or hard or nasty it is, love remains. It is constant. It has never slipped or fall or fail any second. And thirdly, maybe the reason he says love is the greatest is because you cannot morally purchase the love of God. 
It is unearned, undeserved, and unmerited favor. Before you ever had a thought of God, before you ever had an emotion toward God, he fully loved you. And we we can't morally purchase or bend his arm and make him love us more, even before he loved us. Maybe that's why love's the greatest. So my heart, the sermon today, is maybe for the people out there who are a little skeptical, a little cynical, who maybe don't say it out loud, but in the deep recesses of their mind, they ask, does God really love me? Even sinful broken me. I've slipped, fell, faltered a thousand times. Every other love I've known has failed me. It will pass away. Does God really love me? Will his love really last? Maybe the words of Paul in another letter. For I am sure, confident, certain that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers or height or depth or anything in all creation will be able to separate me or tear me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you came in here today wondering, does God really love me? It feels too good to be true. It just seems unicorn and rainbows. Will that love last? I hope Paul answers the question for you. He says, get your mind on when the perfect comes. The never-ending, never-breaking, unceasing love God has for you. And the choice comes down to you today. Will you believe that? Will you accept that? Will you receive that? You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But he lovingly, graciously gives you that. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, you receive that agape love that's never ending, you get to spend eternity with him when the perfect comes. What a joy, what a hope it is. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this chapter that reminds us not to focus on, invest in things that are temporary and partial and that will pass away, but God, for our life to be focused on, invested in, pursued the never-ending agape love that you have, that God, that we would receive that and believe in that, that God, then out of that, it would overflow into every other aspect and area of our life. God, for the people here who have always wondered, Will you fail them like others have? Is your love too good to be true? God, may the words of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, bring comfort and hope and joy that they know that your love will never fail or slip or falter for even a second. No matter what they've done, no matter what they're walking through, it is available Let today be the day of salvation. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray.